You see, Laura, that's the kind of music I'm talking about. That's that, that ballroom music. But I, I don't know. I don't know necessarily that that's going to create a bond relationship. I'm here just to listen to the music and dance. Dr. Zyg is the one who has to come up with the answers. Is there any such thing as true love? Sure. Um, when we think about love, and psychologists have investigated love, they come up with many different forms of love, like agape, love of God, and uh, eros, uh, erotic love, and philios, brotherly love. But when we think about love in a relationship, it's really rather simple. I could define it in terms of an acronym, and the acronym would be topaya. T-O-P-I-A-H. And what those letters would stand for is take obvious, and that's the operative word, take obvious pleasure in another's happiness. And it's the difference between, for example, in a male-female relationship, a man who comes home and likes his wife's cooking, and a man who comes home and loves how happy his wife is to cook, because that's her hobby. So it's taking an interactional definition of love. Rather than thinking about love as a feeling, something that exists inside, let's take a snapshot. What does it look like in between two loving people? And what it looks like is topaya, take obvious pleasure in another person's happiness. The terms you used in describing different kinds of love just a moment ago, yes. those are all Greek terms. Yes. And Paul Xantopoulos uh -huh. is the gentleman who's coming on in just a few minutes who is the director of romance, uh -huh. and he's written out lists and lists and lists of the things that we can do for each other, and almost every single one of them has to do with making that other person happy, taking pleasure in their happiness, <laughs> as opposed to being responsible for their happiness. Absolutely. No, because uh, if I can't make you happy, but if I see you doing something that you're really happy with, and I can just be there and take pleasure in mm. your happiness. That's love. Hard to achieve, isn't it? Hard to achieve. Very hard to achieve. Now, how do we learn to do that, though? Um, particularly since so many young people are now coming out of broken relationships. Uh -huh. Their parents didn't stay together. That seems to be so common. Uh -huh. Where's the role model? Well, a simple thing is responding to bids. So one person in a couple says, well, there's a nice tree. And the other person responds to that bid and says, oh, yeah, and I remember a tree like that when we first got together. We sat under that tree. We had a picnic. It was great. So when people learn how to respond to the little bids that their partner makes, they begin to put things away in an emotional bank account. And very quickly, that emotional bank account builds up, and it creates a kind of overflow. It spills over into love. But that only works if the other party is listening yes. when... Party one says, oh, look at that tree. Yes. So if you're listening, one of the biggest problems? Well, presence. Being present and accountable. What's course. the difference? Um, I would say being present is the beginning of listening. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a, if you want to create intimacy, like in my trade, psychologists often accuse patients, well, you have a fear of intimacy. I wouldn't even begin to uh, define intimacy because the concept itself is just so complex. But one thing to begin with is how to be present just to be there, and listening is just one part of being there. Attending visually, being open to what the other person has to uh, offer, being ready to and willing to build on what the other person has to offer. That would be one of the foundations of intimacy, one of the foundations of romance. In addition to that, you would want to try to make love maps. You'd want to understand how does, this, how does your partner experience love? What's this person's map of love? Because some people, to them, touch is love. To some people, intimate communication is love. To some people, good deeds is love. To some people, shared interests, doing things together, that's love. So when one person takes the time to try to understand the heartland of another person and to really be able to map it out, that begins to create emotional intimacy and uh, romantic acts, of course, that's part of it. Is just the very idea of loving someone different from one gender to another? Is that Mars-Venus thing um, a reality as far as you're concerned? Well, yes, in a whole number of ways. Uh, an old saw is that, for example, uh, men have sex in order to get close and women get close in order to have sex. So the, the gender differences are, the research is just blossomed in that area, understanding even brain functioning, how women's brains and men's brains function completely different, 
And when you look at them uh, through a functional MRI, for example, what happens when people are in love, what areas light up, there are similarities, but there are distinct differences. But how, how will men and women ever thoroughly, totally, and completely communicate if they're operating from two different cultures altogether? Well, uh, you know, Freud, in one of his uh, statements, said that he would never, he could never understand the human psyche. So if Freud couldn't understand the human psyche, uh, we guys, we would be a little at a loss. Mm -hmm. Are you hopeful, though, that, uh, that romance will continue unabated, that it will be a fundamental desire for everybody to just simply have someone close to them that's important to them for a long, committed period of time? Yeah. There are, biologically, we need to pair bond, and there are like three different brain centers. There's a center for love, or for, for, for erotic attachment, where you see somebody across the room and you're, you're, you just light up. And there's another center for attraction, where you sort the similarities. And then there's another brain center for long-term bonding. And uh, when, so people can, uh, are built, they're biologically built to bond. And that's a neural itch. It's not something that we just psychologically apply. Um, some people be are better built to bond than others. Uh, all people have some ability to just be erotically interested in somebody else. And these three brain centers, well, they act independently. So you could be attracted to one person and uh, erotically interested in another and bonded to a third person. The human engineering is not so well designed from a biological basis in order to have uh, enduring love. Based on your practice and the fact that we only have about 30 seconds left, yeah. based on your practice and your experience, people coming to you mm -hmm. having great difficulty in relationships, tell us a pitfall to avoid. Yeah. One of the most common pitfalls, I've been doing marital counseling for 30 years, the most common pitfall is conversion. So sometimes I feel like when I'm seeing couples, it's an ecumenical conclave, and I'm supposed to be the bishop and say, who's really right? And so one person is trying to convert, he's just the right man uh, for me as soon as I can get him over his compulsiveness, and she's just the right woman for uh, him as soon as he can get her over her alcoholism and then they spend the next 10 years trying to be better therapists or better patients to each other. By the time they come for me, it's not psychotherapy, it's supervision. They're trying to learn how to be better therapists or better patients for each other. So the conversion process is something difficult because people just don't necessarily accept and deal with the personality differences that are inherent in any relationship. Even before you need the professional counseling, of a clinical psychologist like Dr. Zeig, perhaps long before you have to go to him and his practice, maybe it's something as simple as seeing the director of romance, getting past some of those early questions that you might have. 